If you're a professional brewer, you know how frustrating it can be when you go to place a yeast order and what you're looking for is out of stock. Well, Imperial Yeast is here to help by guaranteeing that commercial orders up to 20 liters of 10, yes, 10 of their most popular strains will ship free if they're not in stock when you place your order. Some of these strains include A38 Juice for those hazy IPAs, A07 Flagship, a classic in clean American styles, L13 Global, which is said to be one of the world's most popular lager strains, A44 Kviking for your warm fermented beers, and so many more. So in addition to pitching right with the highest quality yeast on the market, they're promising that yeast will be ready when you need it or shipping is on them. Whether you're a pro or a home brewer, if you haven't tried Imperial Yeast in your brewery, it's time to up your game. You can check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and place your commercial orders at imperialyeast.com. Fermentation is the process whereby a living organism, yeast, metabolizes sugar and produces alcohol as a byproduct. In the case of beer, this sugar comes primarily from malted barley that gets mashed to create wort, which happens to be a fairly hospitable environment for yeast to do their work. However, there are other fermented beverages where this isn't quite the case. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me on this episode to discuss the use of yeast nutrients when it comes to making hard cider is contributor Matt Del Fiaco. Yeah, and the use of yeast nutrients is obviously really well established in wine uh, and by transition cider, which is very, very almost identical to wine in a lot of ways. Uh, and as brewers, like uh, we haven't had to think about it too much. Like there is obviously places where it is a more appropriate to maybe use a yeast nutrient, or you might want to. Sure. Um, but for the most part, like you mentioned, wort is a fairly hospitable environment for our yeast. So uh, when people make that transition into mead or into uh, wines and ciders, it's just another dimension of things you have to include, think about, and leverage. Uh, it's another tool in the toolbox. So it's going to be great to go through that material and just talk through its usage. And some of it transitions to beer a little bit. So it'll be, I think, just good info all around. Yeah, absolutely. And like you, Matt, I'm a huge fan of hard cider. I know that you've probably, I think you've done most, if, if not all, maybe I've done one of the cider experiments uh, for Brulosophy? I think you did do one. You did the uh, filtered versus unfiltered store-bought juice. That's right. That's right. And so uh, you and I have kind of a passion for this cider thing, but we don't get to talk about it too often. I'm really stoked uh, to talk about using yeast nutrients in hard cider on this episode, as well as getting into the experiment that you did on the subject. All right. If you enjoy what it is we're doing here at Brulosophy, consider becoming one of our patrons, where in exchange for your support, you get a cool reward. Things like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at Yakima Valley High com and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Our guest for September of 2021 is experienced home brewer, pro brewer, and author Colin Kaminsky. Uh, in addition to his work as the master brewer of Downtown Joe's Brewery in Napa, California, Colin co-authored Water, a comprehensive guide for brewers with John Palmer. Uh, it was also Colin who messaged me a few years ago about this unique idea regarding yeast vitality, which inspired us to experiment what is, with what is now referred to as vitality starters. Uh, as you might imagine, Colin is a wealth of knowledge. This is going to be a great session to be a part of it. You have to make your pledge by Friday, September 24th. So we have time to get you added to the private Facebook group uh, by that Saturday, September 25th, 2021. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind leaving a rating and review in Apple podcast or wherever it is, you listen to podcasts that allows you to leave ratings and reviews. We really would appreciate that as well. Feedback is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri-clover, compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including high-quality stainless fittings at great prices with very fast shipping. Learn more at brewershardware.com, and don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's brewershardware.com. Listener John Crawford from Houston, Texas, wrote in with an opinion on adjusting the mineral profile of sparge water after listening to episode 197. John says, you both mentioned you adjust your entire volume of water together to make the minerals homogenous and to ensure you have the desired characteristics of minerality in the finished beer. Personally, I brew with distilled water and use a batch sparge method. I calculate my total mineral adjustments assuming a no sparge method and only add them to my mash water. This ensures the mash water has all the proper quantity of ions to buffer the impact from my grain bill and hit my target pH. Then I batch sparge with straight distilled water. The total ion levels of the finished beer end up the same as if I added the minerals to the total volume of water, but it prevents me from needing to collect the total volume altogether then split it up. Uh, I think this method would still work for brewers who use non-distilled water as the ion concentrations in the finished product are the same either way. 
the only I, I actually I generally agree. I think that's fair feedback. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing I would hedge on is like obviously the mash pH and like wanting to make sure that while the mash is going on that you have. Th- you have the uh, the concentration of nutrients that you need to hit that target pH and to yeah. like make sure that you are being consistent in it. Consistency being the key, right? If like if you do this every time, you've adjusted, you've gotten your process to it. That's the that's the better answer, right? Uh, so that's the only thing I would like make sure is like as you're doing that, just making sure that you do have the proper amount for the pH to be appropriate. Uh, and then yeah, you're right. Like the final product ends up being. Uh, that total that total concentration so not a big deal like you can do it that way uh, I would just make sure you have an eye on the mesh pH yeah yeah this approach does make a lot of sense to me as well um, and, and I, I was messing around with um, the brewfather uh, water calculator just to kind of see what happened with pH what would mm-hmm. happen with the pH when you split it like that um, it, it it's it's hard to create a scenario where it really has a huge enough impact that it would, you know, I guess detriment, uh, detrimentally impact the beer. And so I, I see it as being a really valid approach. Uh, if you just want to simplify your water chemistry work, basically, I only do full volume mashing these days. So it's a moot point for me, but for those who do fly or batch sparge, this seems like an easy way to, again, simplify, uh, another step in the brew day. So thanks for the idea, John. Uh, if you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. I know we went a few episodes last year with no beer review, but that was because of the impact COVID stuff had on all of our work schedules and whatnot. This is the first episode where we actually have no review because Jersey is no longer around. He moved to another state and, uh, you know, we, we, we ran out of all of the reviews that we had in our in the chamber, as it were. Now, he still has some work to finish up here in Fresno. So we are planning on doing uh, a fun show where where you know, one of our quote unquote live shows where we have friends around and, and we just drink and review a handful of listener submitted beers, which I have a ton of still. Uh, but we're also going to introduce you all to the person who's going to be replacing Jersey. Uh, I think I mentioned in a recent episode that f- of those, the 3000 plus of you guys who uh, did the the one question survey that we put out there last month, uh, I think a, 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 a overwhelming majority, it was like 60% basically uh, said that they'd prefer that we just replace Jersey with another funny dude. And so that's what we're going to be doing. He'll be on that show as well. So the one minute beer review will continue with Tim and his a, a new sidekick who, again, we will announce uh, in that one one episode. All right, when we're back from this break, we'll be talking about using neat yeast nutrients in hard cider. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at craftmastergrowlers.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort, from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature, in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to grainfather.com, that's grainfather.com, and get started today. 
family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code BREWPOD. That's B-R-U-P-O-D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. All living organisms require nutrients in order to maintain health and perform better, and that includes yeast, the fungus tasked with converting otherwise sugary liquids into the wonderfully boozy beverages we all love so much. Now, up to this point, we've tended to focus primarily on beer, but for this episode, we are shifting our focus to hard cider. So just to go through yeast nutrient a little bit, right? Like just independent of <clears throat> independent of anything else, it is effectively a way for you to make sure that the yeast has an environment it needs in order to do its job effectively, right? Like the so in we're in that sense we're talking about alcohol production, we're talking about like cell production, uh, making sure the growth phase is adequate. Yeah. Now, these yeast yeast nutrients contain generally the same things but there's there's quite a few things that can be different between them and we'll go into like specific yeast nutrients in a little bit but effectively you're looking at like uh, dimonium phosphate so that is nit- effectively adding nitrogen as well as some other things uh now brewer's wort and we'll talk about this but contains quite a bit of nutri- of, of nitrogen not a problem as we think about other uh other ba- uh, other batches Definitely, we start to think through like what the role nitrogen has and specifically what it would be uh, detrimental not to have it. So we have dimonium phosphate. Usually there's yeast holes, like some lipids and fatty acids, which we've talked about before, like having necessary being necessary for new cell production effectively. Uh, of course, there's some he- trace heavy metals like magnesium and zinc, zinc being one of the critical ones that uh, wort actually doesn't really have. Uh, folic acid, and really all of this just to say... Yeast nutrients are providing these minerals that help the yeast to do its job effectively. It's right. going through. Uh, and using them, in theory, helps a ha- have you a happy fermentation, a healthy a healthy fermentation, reducing some off flavors, uh, you know, re- staving off a sluggish fermentation. And really, in the case of things like cider and meat or wine, especially when, or even like high gravity beers, uh, they, in theory, help. Uh, get away from fusel alcohols, right? Like, so that right. hot character you tend to join. So adding yeast nutrients in these situations tends to help us stave off not these off flavors, but as well as just being critical for that yeast to do its job to actually grow effectively. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think you make a good point. Um, you know, uh, it, th- that when you properly care for these yeast, which means, you know, adding nutrient, they are going to do more of what you want them to do. That's how my, my, my simple, yes. how I simplify you know, what, <laughs> exactly. what nutrients are. But, in, but at the same rate, uh, you know, you think the way I think about yeast, at least, is that there are some and we, I know you and I both have played around with different types of yeast strains uh, in when making hard cider, uh, but different yeast will produce different characteristics uh, that you want. So for example, if you're using a Saison yeast and you take care of that yeast and you and you treat it well and you and you make the, the environment that must, right, the, the apple juice, you right. make that environment as hospitable to that yeast as possible, it's, it's more likely to give you what it is you're looking for uh, from that yeast. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. You're just ensure in <clears throat> the same way that you would do anything else. Again, like we talked about this being a lever, a tool in the toolbox, which there are, for example, <clears throat> some, uh, I actually know the year that, uh, the year humble brag that I won gold at the, uh, the <laughs> home, the, for cider, uh, at the national homebrewers competition, the man who ended up winning a uh, cider maker of the year and he had won gold for his apple wine, uh, which is delicious, but again, like high alcohol. Uh, he actually did a great piece in Zimmergy, like talking about his process, and he intentionally went with lower nutrients in order to try not to have as complete a fermentation, leave behind some of the sugar. Um, <clears throat> so again, like it is a tool in the toolbox. You yeah. want this to be something that you're paying attention to so you can have consistency, so you have uh, you know intentional outcomes. But again, uh, 
if you want a complete fermentation, especially in something like cider, you're looking at using nutrients. Yeah, I'm gonna. I've got a little anecdote, and what uh, it's actually what inspired me to to pick up yeast nutrient for the first time ever. I don't use yeast nutrients in my brewing when I'm making mm-hmm. beer, um, but I I've been making cider for a couple of years, and um, I you know we have a, a messaging group with all of the Brewlosophy guys, and I they, I was I threw a batch together, and it had been 24 hours. I think I I, I pitched Bell Saison or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, a yeast that I use often for fermenting yeah. uh, store-bought apple juice. And I, I remember tossing a, just a picture of it to you guys 24 hours later. And Jake says, uh, you know, contributor Jake Houlihan says, why isn't it fermenting yet? <laughs> it's been 24 hours. And <laughs> I was like, wow, this is normal. You know, you, you, you sprinkle on a, a, a pack or two of uh, Belle Saison of dry yeast, and it takes a good 36 hours before you start to notice any fermentation activity. And Jake goes, uh, "That it, that's not true at all. Are you yeah. adding any yeast nutrient? I said, no. And he explained to me that when he uses yeast nutrient he is usually he makes the same cider only difference is he's a mile up because he's up in denver colorado uh he says when he uses yeast nutrient it reduces his lag time literally down to about 12 hours which is like brewing beer for me it's fermenting beer so i went i picked up some yeast nutrient and no joke uh the, the the biggest difference that i saw was a decrease in lag a significant decrease in that lag time so that nutrient is clearly doing something to the yeast right that to me was yeah. an indicator that there was something good that the yeast was getting out of that nutrient addition um and and it made me wonder on, on you know on one you know you think about wort and you think about grain and we know that barley malt or or any other type of malted grain for the most part will bring with it uh certain nutrients that are beneficial to the yes. yeast when when I think about cider or, you know, uh, apple juice in general, um, I, you know, I never, never crossed my mind that it's deficient in a lot of that stuff. Well, a big, <clears throat> it is, it's super deficient a lot. So like in effectively it's, it gets tough a little bit, but the, one of the biggest things, and we just touched on this. And so I'll go through a little bit, but nitrogen is so important to yeast and to proper yeast health and yeast in, in, in a malted or in a wart, right? And you have a, something that's gone through the malting process. It creates enough free nitrogen uh, through the breakdown of some proteins that the yeast is going to be able to access it. And so we're talking about effectively yeast assimilable nitrogen or yan. You'll see like yan out there, Y-A-N or a uh, fan free amino nitrogen, mm-hmm. which again, separate you usually you're paying attention to yan, but doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> But you're right, like it, through the malting process, it brings in that nitrogen, it brings in trace metals uh, that are available through the through the barley. Uh, now, of course, as you dilute that grain bill, as you bring in things like corn and rice, or uh, even just like straight sugar, you start to dilute relative to your wort how much nutrients are gonna be in there. So that is like one of the reasons when we talk about higher gravity uh, environments that are more toxic, they may be diluted with, you know, like uh, flaked oats or, which again, like have metals, which is great, but they yeah. don't necessarily have uh, the 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 nitrogen, and they for sure don't have the zinc. Like zinc being one of the key deficiencies in brewer's wort, um, and of course, like zinc is actually super important for cell production as well as alcohol production, or like the synthesis of alcohol, uh, which. Again, that may be why you add something to a higher gravity wart or right. just to any wart. You may want to add zinc, but this nitrogen component is huge. And when you look at wine yeasts and when you look at cider yeasts, a huge component of it. And this is, I think, is something we can talk about as maybe a something missing from the experiment we're discussing today was a discussion of the nutrient requirements for uh for the the nitrogen requirements for yeasts, you'll end up using nutrient based on what that yeast is going to require. Uh, and cider, effectively, like you tend to be nitrogen deficient. Right. You tend to like not have not have as good a, and that's why you see some of that sluggish fermentation. It's why you see some of that off flavors. Uh, and a lot of the, a lot of the uh, the the nutrients that you buy at the store, like. Yeast or having that free nitrogen is one of the most important critical pieces of it. So I have, um, a, I have a question then for you, Matt, as somebody who um, who has exp- I've never used like fresh pressed juice. Um, that, that's something I know you do annually. It's a kind of a tradition for you, right? Yes, it is. It's a cider day. It's coming up in a month or so here, I think. Uh, and the trees look the trees look good, so I'm excited. Uh, that's so awesome. You're excited, <laughs> if you will. Um, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> so dumb. horrible I, hey come on matt it's been a while i gotta give this to you yeah that's great <laughs> so um is there a difference i this is one of the things that i wondered about when i did that experiment uh comparing store-bought 
apple juices, one unfiltered, one not. When, yeah. w- is there a difference in the uh, available nutrients, whatever those nutrients may be? I know we're going to break those down in a minute, but but is there a difference in the available nutri- nutrients that are in fresh pressed juice versus something that's gone through a clarification, you know, filtration <sighs> process? Yeah, right, right, right. Probably not enough to make a huge difference, right? Like there is still, uh, as it gets filtered, of course, the main thing that's getting removed there is any like especially in let's say this because you did a an unfiltered right um when you did the store-bought juice and of course that was using dessert apples it's going to have a higher sugar content not as much acidity so on so forth um the main thing getting filtered out of course is like the the material like the actual apple material and especially when we press cider every year i am far 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 from a professional cidery and so like when we press these things quite a bit of apple material will also transition along with the uh the, the fresh juice into the actual from you're talking about like the apple flesh the apple skin stuff i am like i'm talking okay. like actual apple material right okay. yeah. um and it's small because we do i use a bag like i've got a fresh press like it is very very small but is there uh that's one of the main differences where there's probably like there's extra contributions from those things in the wort or not in the wort i'm sorry in the juice and so but not that big a difference. Like it's not like going through that filtering is a huge impact on like nitrogen effectively. Right. Um, but one of the issues I do see typically, like a lot of the juice we have is from concentrates and thermal stress. Uh, not, not that all concentrate comes from thermal. It doesn't actually, uh, a lot of the, the production of concentrate doesn't involve like a thermal process, but okay. going through processing can introduce some thermal stress on the juice. Uh, you're looking at, of course, less, some of these uh, juices that you'll see will add certain nutrients because right. uh, they're meant to be, they're meant to be drank. Uh, and so you just have to pay attention. It's not that the pr- fresh pressed versus store-bought is going to be super, super drastic between each other. One of the reasons we did this experiment was to see if there was going to be like an impact notable difference um, with these nutrients, because in theory, they should have very, very similar, but we're again missing that nitrogen component. Hmm. Yeah. And is uh, that so? It's it's one of the 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 biggest things about this, and the reason we clarify store bought juice, I think, for this one so much, is because it's almost like uh, improving your wine kit sort of thing. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, if you can't go to Napa Valley and press press a bunch of fresh grapes, <laughs> then you're going to figure out a way to make this work with a concentrate, which is typically what we'll see in these uh, wine kits, and. If it's not the product you want, how do you make it a little bit better? So if yeah. you buy juice from the store, which again, not everyone has access to uh, a press every year or fr- or it's expensive like to get fresh press juice typically yeah. unless you're buying in bulk or uh, cider buy, which is always great. You are doing the best you can with what you've got. <clears throat> and one of the ways to improve that is to make sure that your product has the appropriate amount of nutrients. Yeah. So not not too different, but it's the, it's again, we do the experiment so that we learn and I'm I'm sold on it. Like I've been used I use nutrients all the time. Um, and I've been working on trying to like win medals with store bought juice <laughs> and uh, doing very pretty well and i i attribute a lot of that to uh to nutrient use yeah i mean you take care of the living organism that does most the brunt of the work for you i mean making cider takes like what five minutes <laughs> i mean if you're if you're pressing the apples yes that's a different it depends story. on how uh, how complicated you want it to be but it can be quick and especially when you have done some work you've got a consistent product uh i use i use kirkland juice from costco yeah typically yeah. if i do that and i know what the uh, total acidity is of that juice. I know roughly what the gravity is going to be every time. Uh, and then, yeah, it does take five minutes because I know exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. You do a little bit of legwork to get, to get to that point of what am I adding? How much of it am I adding? What is the yeast nutrient or what is the nutrient requirement of my yeast? But once you have all that stuff and you're going for consistency, you're in a much better place. It doesn't take nearly the time of brew day. And it's uh, as someone who's recently had some uh, some health issues, it takes a lot of uh, stress off of your body. Yeah. Because it is, of course, <laughs> heavy still. It's five gallons or six gallons of liquid, uh, but it is a little bit less cumbersome. So it, it has its pros, pros and cons. <laughs> well, let's, you talked a little bit about, I mean, quite a bit about nitrogen. Are there any other uh, nutrients that, that yeast, I mean, the yeast that we're using, and maybe this is something we should focus on for a minute, the yeast that we use to ferment cider, I think a lot of people get kind of caught up in the, you know, there's wine yeast and then there's, and then there's, right. you know, ale yeast and then there's a uh, lager yeast. And the, but, but really, um, if my understanding, at least, I mean, w- one of my favorite yeast for cider recently is Imperial Yeast Bubbles. Um, 
time. And to me, it, yeah, it, Bubbles it, is great. It's really good, right? And it and it leave to me at least. I get a much more appley character out of the fermented juice, and it finishes somewhere around ten o five, ten o six. The three times that I've used it, as opposed to dr- dropping out all the way to you know point nine 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 or whatever. Uh, but it le- it results in a in a in a in a cider that has more apple character. But that yeast, if I'm not mistaken, is just like an English ale strain. I, I don't know for sure, but it, that's the rumor on the street. <laughs> well, it is, and it is for sure. And then a lot of the, uh, I, I mean, a lot of wine yeast you see are like English strains that have been cultivated, right? Um, and so it is definitely, and we do get into a little bit. There are some differences, like how effectively can something uh, you get into like. Uh, yeasts that can ferment uh, do like a malolactic fermentation versus not um, in some of the specific yeast requirements, but using, I, I see tons and tons and tons of just straight up English ale strains like Nottingham used to be super popular as a dry yeast. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I know you mentioned Balsaison still very popular bubbles, which confirmed is an ale yeast. Uh, and I, I want to throw this in there that the nitrogen requirement for bubbles is about a hundred PPM nitrogen, something that we wanted. We didn't know going into this experiment and should have, um, <laughs> but it was really, really fascinating to like, just hear from the team about it. But yeah, the, <sighs> using you're not you're not intentionally doing something wrong right like by using an english ale strain or a a classified english ale strain as opposed to a classified wine strain right and it does there are things that wine strains have been propagated to do that an english ale strain may not and then also we're looking a little bit at alcohol tolerance uh, once we get into that space but use but it's not going to be like this huge huge radical difference uh though i will say when you uh used 10 you say like 1006 i think my gravity when i used it was like with nutri we can talk about this a little bit but i actually usually get into like the one point or 1.002 ish or 1.003 ish area with it um sometimes a little bit lower so it does do a pretty complete fermentation yeah bubbles bubbles is pretty uh, is very effective so yeah and and that you know i've gotten low lower or better attenuation as well um but but my point in bringing up the different yeast strains is that where you know they might have different i guess and i want to put this in air quotes but requirements in terms of nutrients (laughs) But yeast is yeast. They 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 all need to be treated well if you want it to consistently do the job that you want it to do. Yeah. What are some of those nutrients outside of nitrogen? Is there anything else? I mean, I, again, I'm thinking of these these nutrient blends that you can buy online. Uh, you know, and a, a lot of them are like dead yeast cells and stuff yeah. like that. Like, what what what's the difference for cider? Yeast holes are pretty great because they they provide lipids and fatty acids. Um, which if you if you listen to the <clears throat> If you listen to some of our uh, talks in the past on just uh, yeast health, and especially I think in our high gravity brewing episode, we talked about this quite a bit, but the production of new cells is lipids and fatty acids are incredibly critical for like cell wall maintenance and making sure that new cells are growing effectively. So that growth phase um, Yeast, as you mentioned, yeah, dead yeast, like yeast holes are super important. They provide those lipids and fatty acids. Then, of course, zinc is in quite a few of these <clears throat> other uh, nutrient packs that we'll see online because zinc really helps, as we mentioned, with like the synthesis of alcohol and the production of cells. Uh, and this is actually typically deficient in brewer's wort. Like this is something that we typically don't get. Uh, we also, of course, get magnesium. We get you'll typically th- see things like biotin, uh, like so biotin, like the uh, the stuff you take if you're like trying to grow hair or uh-huh. you're trying to <laughs> get thicker hair. Uh, biotin is super critical uh, as part of this, and then phos- uh, phosphate is super popular. So, like I mentioned, nitrogen comes in the form typically of dimo- uh, dimonium phosphate. Dimonium phosphate also includes, of course, phosphate, which is super critical for uh, the growth phase of fermentation. So we have quite a few nutrients that come into these, and they do tend to vary like a little bit just based on what the actual one is. Uh, I know like Fermate O and Fermate K are really popular uh, as far as different yeast nutrients go. Uh, Go Firm is one that I've used quite a bit in conjunction with those two uh, that I love. Of course, there's just like yeast nutrient from uh, Y yeast, which is geared more towards beer, but does include a lot of like those typical uh, critical nutrients that come along mm-hmm. with it. That's actually the one that I've used the most is the Y yeast. It comes in a little vial type of thing. It's fantastic. And, yeah, yeah, it's a and, great it's a great brewer's nutrient. And well, and I've never used it for beer. I've, I, what I do is I just whenever I'm making cider, I just fill up the cap. It, with, I found that the cap is I think it's like two teaspoons or something. But I, I kind of do a mound on the cap and I pour that into the bottom <laughs> of my of my uh, uh, 
you know, carboy. And then I just dump the, the store-bought juice right on top and pitch the yeast. And there you literally go. within about 12 hours, I see activity. So wh- now, now one other question I've got for you, because I, I feel like um, in, in our chats over the years about making cider, we've never really talked about something that a lot of people focus on when it comes to yeast health and performance in brewing. And that's oxygenation. I mean, I, how yeah. many people out there are actually oxygenating their, their juice before pitching yeast? Uh, I- it depends on who you talk to. Uh, but again, like, so yeast, <clears throat> typically you're looking in like the 1045, 1050 range yeah, for yeah. a cider. And that's usually going to get down to like one or uh, some, especially like if you're using an actual wine yeast. So you're looking at a little bit higher alcohol of an environment, uh, one that's a little bit nutrient deficient and one that's of course nitrogen deficient. So you want to make sure as always that your again consistency that your yeast has what it needs and yeast needs oxygen in order to go through its growth phase like it's as you wind up for fermentation uh you want healthy yeast so really you see almost everyone oxygenating their wort uh or oxygenating the juice they use for cider now that said i've done it before of just tossing it in because the the motion of pouring juice into the fermenter, which right. I'm pretty harsh about you again, you can get up to like that six PPM, a PPM oxygen. And you start to like look in that area of like having enough. Now, if I'm doing like a really like an apple wine, like doing a really high fermentation, I will use pure oxygen just in order to make sure that that environment is, is perfect. Yeah. Uh, but you're also one of the nice things is if you look into the ways in which nutrients are typically added, you'll either see people add them all at once Um, or in a staggered approach. Yes. And part of that staggering is reintroducing some oxygen into your solution, uh, which is going to, again, like it's, it's providing a over time healthier for your war. So basically like if you throw everything in at once, yeast is an animal. It's going to start doing or not an animal. It's a, it's a living thing though, but it it starts to just take in everything it can. It's going to go for the easiest things first. Uh, It's going to just take everything and, over time, it'll, of course, diminish the nutrients uh, as it's gone through its growth phase. You're starting to see more. You might potentially just adding it all up at front. And this, again, depends on the environment it in, depends on what you're brewing, depends on uh, what what's actually in the wort, or the wort or juice or must composition based on what you're doing. If you add it all in at once, you might find yourself having like a slower fermentation a little bit down the line. Uh, you might see yourself having starting to have maybe a couple off flavors. And so they a lot of people recommend staggering those nutrient additions. And there's calculators out there if you want to look into this. It's called uh, just like sta- staggered nutrient additions is an easy lookup. Um, <clears throat> there's actually some fantastic calculators that will also help you determine like the yeast rec- or will help you determine how much to add of these nutrients in order to meet like nitrogen requirements. If right. you put in the nitrogen requirement of your yeast you can look that up but by staggering it you provide a more consistent uh consistent healthy environment for your yeast over time yeah uh, as it's going through those phases and you're introducing a little bit of oxygen which i've i've started for a lot of like my meads and some of my hard ciders i don't use an airlock for the first like five or six days <laughs> just as regardless i just let it go uh and it ends up all it's been it's been great actually it's been i've seen some good results from doing it so yeah. again Yes, you'll see oxygen for the same reasons you'll see it in beer. It's it's needed for your yeast. Uh, it depends on what you're going for. Of course, it's a tool in the toolbox. But yeah, you'll see a lot of oxygen. Yeah. So I do the same thing as you where I just pour it into the pour the juice <laughs> into the carboy with yes, vigor, yeah. you know, and it gets bubbly. And uh, but but I've never used I've never owned an oxygenation setup uh, for right. brewing for cider. That's just one of those things that I, I'm you not, seem proud of that. You bring I, it up I, all the know, time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud that I never spent the money on it, I suppose. But I, I don't care if people want to do it. I've never seen the need for it. Um, but but like you said, I, you know, I definitely understand that yeast require oxygen as a nutrient uh, yeah. to, to perform properly. And so I do pour with vigor. I don't do staggered. Uh, nutrient additions only because I kind of th- the way I was taught about the, or the reasons that you would stagger a nutrient addition in something like cider or mead or wine is because of the high alcohol uh, content. Yep. And so you want to feed that yeast as it continues to work for you. I'm usually making ciders that are in the five to 6% range. And I, I again, yeah. that's just not high enough for me to really worry about it. And making that single addition works for me. Yeah. Same. I, I actually do the same thing where it is just a single addition. Um, <clears throat> I do for, for regular ciders, I will do like just a standard edition up front. Uh, again, apple wine is where I'll start to get into like that staggered, that staggered yeah. approach. I'll do yeah. all at once the same as you. Cause you're right. Like you're a standard cider. You're sitting around five or 6%, which you want to do what's right for your yeast. Uh, but I, 
in some cases don't want to overhandle it either. Yeah, uh, and that yeah. just ends up getting into that territory. Right. Well, like I said, I, uh, I started adding yeast nutrient because of uh, the recommendation of Jake. And I noticed right off the bat that uh, fermentation started quicker and it seemed to uh, not take as long for fermentation to complete for, for attenuation to be done. Uh, and it was because of these observations and fermentation activity that I started using yeast nutrients as a matter of course when making hard cider. But I always wondered if it might be having a perceptible impact as well. That's what you aim to find out in an experiment that you performed, Matt, results when we return from this break. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, Do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. The brew in a bag method has blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAV experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality, food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at checkout out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. One of the most appealing things about making hard cider, for me at least, is that it's super easy. It takes maybe 10, 15 minutes once you've acquired the juice. Uh, for me, it was this, <laughs> this simplicity that led me to overlooking the importance of yeast nutrients for a couple of years, uh, which adds maybe two extra minutes to the process at most, uh, at least in my experience. And, and it, uh, it, again, observationally at least, it leads to better fermentation. Uh, but does it have an impact on the perceptible characteristics of cider? Yeah, that's the, that's the goal of this one to find out. And like you, I mean, one of the nice things about using uh, store-bought cider for this is the brewing process involves going to the store and buying cider, uh, which is <laughs> so really <easy>. nice <laughs> or buying, buying juice and then just driving home with it. Um, and really, so once I got this home, poured those five gallons of, or poured the 10 gallons into separate fermenters, five gallons each, obviously, um, <laughs> made some measurements. We're looking at uh, an original gravity of about uh, 1049. So no sugar additions, especially as that ferments down, it is going to be more than enough for us to more than enough alcohol for sure. Uh, that sits around, I think like six, six percent, six and a half, something like that. Um, anyways, with that, we dosed one of those with two teaspoons of Fermate O. So Fermate O is a yeast nutrient that I really love. Um, it is effectively the or it's an organic version you also hear like for made k yeah. and using go with go firm and go firm you'll see people use uh a diammonium phosphate uh dap you can buy dap separately uh just for that nitrogen addition you'll see people use both typically though with go firm or with uh fermato you'll only see one of those so use the fermato and what fermato typically contains is uh 
effectively a it's a just highly efficient nutrient that can doesn't contain dap it doesn't contain any of like those other materials but it does contain um a sim- and through a uh, an organic compound like assimilable amino acids right yeah. so it's, it's an organic nitrogen um it definitely it contributes quite a bit to the wort and so or quite a bit to the wort or the juice whatever you happen to be using it on <laughs> uh we use those two, two teaspoons we did it up front like just as we sort of discussed uh no need to like stagger i do think it'd be cool uh, in the future we'll do like a, a staggered versus straight up nutrient edition yeah um probably in a meter or something where we potentially might see more of that impact yes but here uh just did it up front we want to just make sure that we see what we got uh and we did uh, after putting that in pitched imperial bubbles uh into the each of those batches uh which again like i hadn't had tons of experience with so i was happy to use it uh and I will say, like, this is just to reiterate that yeast, uh, the nitrogen requirement for imperial bubbles is about 100 ppm nitrogen. Um, so it's, a, it's moderately media or it's moderately nitrogen. Uh, it has moderate ni- nitrogen needs effectively. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm, you're, you said two teaspoons for made. Oh, uh, we didn't yep. do a staggered edition just to kind of spell this out. Uh, it, 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 at least my thinking about it. The OG of this juice was 1049. I mean, that's pretty low. Yeah. Uh, you know, to, in my head, I'm thinking this is this isn't the type of must or, or 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 liquid that's going to require staggered additions or anything over overly complicated like that. So, well, it is six and a half percent alcohol. Like it is, it is definitely like for our brewers, we're like, oh, 1049. That's not much. Yeah. Um, but for for a cider, it is again, it's not super super high, but it is still a. Uh, you're you're starting to walk the line of a higher alcohol fermentation. Sure, yeah, uh, sure. You're, you know, like that. Usually, we'll say like, oh, eight percent alcohol is a, is a higher fermentation. Uh, we start to get a touch there, but you're right, not not abnormally high by any means. Um, I put those ba- both in my basement uh, just because my basement maintains about a steady sixty four degrees Fahrenheit or eighteen C roughly. Uh, and after about 12 hours, similar to what you talked about in some anecdote earlier, we start to see some visible signs of fermentation uh, in the batch that had nutrients. Yes. Well, the non-nutrient bath, it took like 24 hours. That is awesome. To me, that 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 was the first thing. When, when you proposed this experiment and I, I was just waiting for the next day for the 12 hours later to see if if it worked. And sure enough, the I mean, based, you could go look at the photos and you'll see there are bubbles yes. on top of the yeast nutrient batch and there are none on top of the, the non-nutrient batch so clearly this using yeast nutrients at least in this experience or this experiment and then also multiple people's anecdotal experiences it has an impact on reducing lag time i love that that yeah, alone it is to me. it's a it is it's a clear it's a clear uh benefit something that we already see uh and i mean if you do look at those photos you'll also probably notice that by about day four uh the cider with nutrient that was nutrients seemed to be fermenting well like visible signs of fermentation while the one without nutrients did seem to be slowing down a little bit yeah um, interesting. and again like we start to see that sluggish fermentation not just in the start but in the just overall uh now of course like visual activity one in my experience store-bought juice like filtered juice does not tend to have a very active uh fermentation in the way you'd see like a huge krausen on beer no right no, yeah uh it doesn't it doesn't have 10 typically as much of that visible activity and visible activity isn't a great way to measure fermentation in general but it was crazy just to see those differences of it. And I've done a couple of experiments similar to this in the past, and those were consistent with some of those, uh, consistent with what I'd seen. Now, what is a good uh, indicator of that fermentation is, of course, the final gravity. And after we left both of these ciders at that 64F for two weeks, uh, the one that we used nutrients with had gone down to a uh, had gone down to a just straight 1.000, something we would see as like a typical final gravity for a cider made with a wine yeast or made made with a yeast that's like you know capable of doing that yeah uh the one without nutrients ended up being at 1.003 so just just a touch higher which again that's not too much no. like it's it's enough where you're like maybe this is in line with uh maybe just it was a fluke like maybe something happened and of course this is only a single data point but because of coupling this with the visible fermentation activity and just knowing what the variable was, I, I can't help but think there was probably a role here played by those nutrients. Yeah. I mean, you look at the the evidence so far, the, obser- the observed impact uh, or the differences between these two ciders. One yeah. of them started fermenting quicker. That same one with the nutrients uh, seemed to ferment more actively and it finished at a lower FG. I mean, these to me are all pretty 
pretty obvious signs that uh, good things are happening by by adding fermato at the very least <laughs> right. to the uh, to the apple juice must. I mean that that to me again, like I said it already, but th- this alone is enough for me to go buy yeast nutrient and use it when I'm making my cider. <laughs> It's nice that yeast nutrient is cheap too. It's oh yeah, not, it's yeah, not yeah. it's not a hard insurance package to throw uh, throw things. But the uh, so after we took that final gravity, we of course racked those over to kegs. Um, and something that's interesting here, and again, you might have to go to the website obviously because this is like an audio medium. But uh, looking at the pictures at kegging the. This is the one that surprised me the most because everything else that we've discussed, like slightly higher final gravity, the fermentation going in, I was like, yeah, that's probably going to happen. Yeah. Like this makes sense because we're adding nutrients. This is what's used for. Uh, but the uh, the clarity in those kegging differences was crazy. So to me. weird. Uh, if you like go to the website, look at the photos at kegging, the one with nutrients was actually fairly clear. Uh, I would I would call it very clear at that point, but the sample without that did not have nutrients was just a touch cloudier, um, and that was crazy. That was crazy to me, like seeing how that played out, and potentially like there's some uh, again like just nutri- the nutrients in this help clarity, of course, uh, but just for that to happen so quickly was crazy. Like in two weeks, do we have an understand? I certainly don't, uh, but do we know like what about using yeast nutrient would uh, improve clarity so quickly like that? Is it just that the yeast are like, okay, we did our job. We're going to get out of the way now. I mean, <laughs> it's so curious to me because we know that, 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 you know, uh, in addition to being largely nutrient deficient, uh, apple juice has way less proteins has, you know, the, the chill haze yeah. thing than, than wort or beer. Uh, so what, so it to me, it seems like it's most likely yeast in suspension. Uh, yeah. Oh, I would agree a hundred percent. It's definitely yeast in suspension. Um, and you know, like the, uh, looking, looking at it, like there is a, uh, like the, the trace of metals are going to help things settle out. Mm -hmm. Uh, any sort of calcium that gets added by any of these is going calcium, even in beer helps aid in clarity. Um, and that's going to help things drop out. So it's just, it's a combination of what gets added by it, but it is a hundred percent yeast and suspension there. That's yeah, that's that's so interesting to me that the the, the uh, nutrient <laughs> one, everything about it so far is better in my book. And well, the the <laughs> thing that helps you understand, too, that it is yeast in suspension is that after uh, having those kegged and burst carbonated uh, and then, you know, I just had them conditioning for about three weeks. Uh, they were just there. That was like the next opportunity I had to get the system participants after those three weeks of conditioning. Again, you can look at the photos on the website. I would say identical clarity. Yeah, they do uh, look if, the same. Yeah, they Yeah. So it was definitely yeast and suspension that had that dropped out by the end of it um it was just crazy that it happened so quickly with it but after that conditioning they looked exactly the same so yeah, yeah it was definitely yeast and suspension that had settled out well i think after all of these observations that that were making most of us i think pretty excited about using yeast nutrient we all wondered okay is there going to be a perceptible difference are people going to be able to tell these ciders apart based on the fact that one was made with nutrients and one was one was made without nutrients. Uh, now, before we go and collect data from other people, which we got to do in this uh, experiment, we usually do uh, a series of triangle tests ourselves. Matt, when you tasted these uh, these ciders in a triangle test, how well did you do? What was your performance like? <laughs> so I was actually, I was only right one out of five times. Um, to me, these ciders were effectively identical. I did not taste any difference between them, um, which, you know, given the fermentation and like all that, it, d- it does surprise me quite a bit. Like the fact that the lag time uh, was so stark and the fact that they did have different final gravities, but I just could not tell them apart. They ended up being so, so similar, uh, both, both very good. Uh, I both would have been a little bit better with uh, some acid additions, I think, but <laughs> very, very good in general, uh, especially for like this store-bought cider. And so I I went in really skeptical because I, I just could not tell. One out of five is not good. Like I'm usually a little better. <laughs> well, well, I, mean, I would say that's just that's just bad guesses, effectively. Exactly. Uh, that, that's what I was going to say is that, yeah, we might have observed all of these really cool, uh, you know, good things that the, that the nutrient seemed to do uh, uh, on an objective level, right? An observable level to the, to the cider. But 
your ability to tell them apart, uh, what just wasn't there. They tasted identical, at least to you. Uh, but that is why we serve these to blind participants as well. And in this yeah. experiment, you got uh, 21 people to do a completely blind triangle test. The only thing they knew is that it was cider, not beer. Uh, but they had no idea what the variable was. Uh, and out of those 21 people, you would have had to have 12 accurately identify the the odd cider out, as it were. Uh, yep. And uh, in the end, how many actually did? Uh, after, so yeah, again, needing 12, we got nine. So that would make it not statistically significant, uh, just that people could not reliably distinguish the cider made with nutrients versus not. And that was kind of in line with my expectations uh, <laughs> after having tried it myself. The, uh, the part that's interesting to me is that I think a lot of people, when it comes to introducing a new step in the brewing and or cider making or wine making process, they want to know that there's some, there's this, there's this, I think, desire to want to believe that it's having a noticeable impact, right? There's a lot of stuff we do though, uh, that is preventative in, in nature or that we do. It's almost like a prophylactic, right? Like yeah. I want to make sure I'm going to, that, that this cider is going to be, uh, as good as possible in the end and that you're going to reduce the risk of uh, introducing off flavors or whatever else it might be. And to me, just the fact that you were able to you know, pitch yeast and have it start fermenting quicker, have it ferment more vigorously, have it dry out more and clear up quicker. All of those, even though they tasted exactly the same in the end, all of those to me are, again, a just evidence that you are doing a good thing by adding a little bit of nutrients, even if it didn't have a perceptible impact on the finished product. Maybe you don't need to, but but there may be that one time where if you had, it would have been beneficial. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's how I think I about do, it. I do. I get it 100% and it is good insurance. And I, I'll even say like as a best practice, as a as a both a brewer and like of course in these other uh styles so like making cider and such i i like lower final gravities if i can get a lower final gravity uh reasonably i'll do it yeah adding nutrients is one of those things that i would consider reasonable for myself and again this is the line <laughs> of what you want to do like how much effort you want to put into it uh if i can get a quicker fermentation if i can get a lower final gravity i'll do it and this is this is a hundred percent. I am totally on board with using the nutrients, if for no other reason than it does seem to have had that impact. Yeah, me too. I, I don't. This is it, it's funny because uh, you know we're known for doing sensory analysis and, and using our palates and our noses and our mouths and. Uh, Flawed. Th yeah. <laughs> this is one where the uh, the easily observed objective. Uh, impact of using nutrients is what is convincing me to do it. And and the ciders tasted identical to both you and yes, the, uh, yeah. the the blind panel of participants. Hey, I'm still going to use nutrients every time in my cider. Oh, making. yeah, I do, too. Yeah, it, it, it it's cheap. It's easy. It's good insurance. And uh, yeah, I'm down. So the one part of that that I would even add is we did this with <clears throat> we did this with bubbles like we did this with the store bought juice that I had purchased. Um, which I believe at the time, I believe I used Walmart juice because not everyone has a Costco. Like I wanted, for some reason, I wanted to use something that was, I thought might be more accessible. <laughs> um, but I, the point is I, we got this in this specific sort of set of circumstances. If this were a higher gravity fermentation, if this was a really high uh, ni nitrogen requirement yeast, who's it could make a difference like that's the thing is like you start to get into these these side cases of i don't want anyone walking out of this experiment saying like oh uh yeast nutrient doesn't have an impact on the flavor of cider that's just it's straight up we don't like that's not something we can say exactly like coming out of this <laughs> that is not the conclusion that we can reach what we can reach is if you use some walmart juice and you're using a moderate nitrogen maybe it's not going to have a super big impact. Yeah. Could yeah. could be like just on these circumstances, but definitely like using that, like measuring that yeast, uh, that nitrogen requirement from the yeast is something that we, as we like think about doing a similar or identical experiment in the future is something we want to pay more attention to. Yeah. Does like, does yeast nutrient make a difference if the yeast really needs nitrogen? Who knows? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, and we weren't the only ones who found this interesting. We got some reader comments we're going to get to. Uh, first one comes from Matthew, who says, was there any noticeable sulfur smell coming out of the airlock uh, of either batch? Uh, both. So the cider, for me at least, cider always smells a little bit like sulfur. So, yeah, me too. That's always my... Yeah, my, that's, yeah. that's just 100%. So I didn't notice it any more or less from either of those batches, unfortunately. Um, 
because that would have been an interesting finding. Like that would have been a really fun, observable thing. But no, for both of these, I always get sulfur every time. Uh, and if you do cider and you get sulfur smell and you're worried about it, don't be because it's super normal. Yeah, sulfur. I, I had this conversation with somebody the other day. Uh, uh, we're having beers over at Crone Wolf and he commented that he made a batch that just had too much sulfur. And I was like, that's one of the easiest things to get rid of, you know? Oh yeah. Uh, absolutely. Sulfur blows, it readily leaves the solution and will, and will blow off if you just purge your keg enough. I mean, so, and yeah. it's, and, and what's interesting is that you, if you make a hoppy beer, what, I mean, we've tested this one out a bunch that those hop aromas aren't leaving the beer necessarily, uh, not as quickly as the sulfur will. So, uh, you know, I, I could see why, why Matthew was wondering this because you would oh, think yeah. that maybe by adding yeast nutrients, you might reduce that sulfur uh, production. But I think it's just a normal part of most yeast fermentations. And often, you know, uh, I smell it with when I'm making lagers, kind of paler yeah. beers that don't have as much hop character as when I usually smell sulfur. So. Well, the hell, like, especially when you're making some of these lighter, like lagers, like a Hellas, a little bit of sulfur is actually like appropriate and maybe a little desirable in, in a Hellas for some people. Uh, it's It goes away so easily that it actually becomes a really hard thing to capture is the fact that because sulfur does just leave these solute like it's so easy to get rid of sulfur. Yeah. Uh, whereas some people want to keep it. It's really, really tough. So yeah. yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but I'm with you, Marshall on uh, just, it's a normal part of this. It's yeah, fine. Yeah. Uh, next comment comes from Dan who says, I wonder how it would turn out with a staggered yeast nutrient addition and daily degassing like Michael Fairbrother's standard mead making process. Take your yeast nutrient addition and divide it up four ways. Add a quarter each day, starting with the first pitch. Once or twice a day, use a degasser to get the CO2 out of solution. After the last staggered yeast nutrient addition, three days into primary, he says, just let it roll like normal. I made a gold medal mead with this method, and I think the same principles would apply with store-bought apple juice. It basically speeds up the process normally required with one plus years of age. That's an interesting comment uh, to me. It does. It does. Uh as far as the age thing goes, that's interesting. Um, that one we can talk, maybe that's like a separate comment we can talk about. But the first part of this, I agree, like definitely uh, similar in composition uh, to the fact where like you would, like that's the reason we would do it. But again, mead, higher alcohol um, is being a part of that. One of the reasons we use staggered nutrient additions in mead and why it's okay to introduce a little bit of that oxygen as the fermentation is taking place. Uh, you want to really lower it down. I agree though. Like it would be really interesting to see the difference between that staggered addition and between uh, just a straight up addition. And I think a mead would be the right place to test that out or like an apple wine, like something that's a really high gravity uh, batch still. But I'm, I'm with you. I think it would be really interesting. I just, for this and like lower, all lower fermentations, like if I made a hydromel, uh, so, so a like a 4% ABV mead effectively, I don't know that I would do a, a staggered nutrient addition for that either. Yeah. Even though yeah. it is mead. Like I'm just, I'm not sure that I would do that. And there, there is something to be said. Um, and there is an amazing book uh, that actually um, a user at Reddit, uh, Engineered Madness, turned me on to, and it's uh, Techniques in Home Winemaking by Daniel Pombianchi. Uh, Pombianchi, might be saying that wrong. But effectively, like it is really interesting to consider the role uh, CO2 has on the potential uptake of nutrients um like just like like those the cider like adding or the nutrients obviously like adding a nucleation point for the escape of co2 right um so and then obviously co2 toxicity being part of that like the degassing uh helps get rid of co2 toxicity in the solution um but definitely it's super interesting i want i'd love to explore it more i just don't know how much of a difference it would have made here specifically right but i do think it's still really interesting i think worth uh, testing out especially in a different environment yeah i i've never even considered uh degassing my cider because i always make sparkling cider so i i've never even thought about what benefit degassing might have to me uh, it it pretty obviously introduces more oxygen um if you're going if you're going to put a degassing wand right in in the cider yeah oh yeah it absolutely introduces oxygen um and really, like that big thing is the P so CO2, right? You start to get, uh, it, it affects your pH, like your fermentation pH as well. And so you might, you might go about doing that so that you can, one, effectively like get the nutrients in, two, reduce the CO2 toxicity in the solution, which is also going to influence the pH. Um, and, in, and I think it's totally fine. And I do, like I said, I've done it. I do it all the time. I do it for every single mead I make pretty much. Uh, I do it for higher gravity ciders and wines. Um, but here, I just don't know. I just yeah. don't know how much of a difference it would make in this environment. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of staggered nutrient additions for sure. Yeah, yeah. 
But yeah, that CO that CO two point in the oxygen, you're right. But then also that CO two toxicity is the is the other side of the coin that you want to think about. Yeah, that's interesting. Yep, things that I've things that I've never thought about. Before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, next comment, final comment comes from Reddit user El Muerte seventeen. He says, "I did a two and a half gallon batch of cider earlier this year using store bought juice and uh, Safel SO four, a very common yeast by the way for making cider. It's what I started yes. with uh, with half a pound of maltodextrin to sweeten it. It came out with a strong sulfur." For smell there's the sulfur thing again and the yeast yeah. settled out so completely there wasn't any left suspended to carbonate when i bottled it i'm told <laughs> yeast nutrient would have prevented the sulfur smell but i was able to eliminate it by popping open each bottle at which point i also added a couple milliliters of yeast and giving it a stir with a piece of copper tubing yeah the copper tubing for sulfur thing is really i mean works it works like that's just it's something that happens i think it was probably unnecessary to do it at this point like again sulfur is going to leave the solution so easily um not as big a deal. And also like, I would be interested to know a little bit more about just like how long they let the fermentation sit, like how long they let that uh, actually like complete out. Cause again, if even if you could reduce the amount of sulfur production with the use of nutrients, which again, like because nutrients are helping you stave off a lot of off characters uh, in this case, one of those being sulfur it in theory, like, yes, that that would be good. And again, I am a fan of using these nutrients. (laughs) However, I would like letting it sit longer is probably going to be a better option than popping open bottles and throwing a copper pipe in it. Yeah. That, that you hear this with, with brew this, the whole like bottle conditioning thing and not there not being enough yeast in solution that, that is rarely ever actually true. You, you right. can, you, I have, I have bottle. It takes very little yeast for that to happen. Like very, very little. I've bottle conditioned beers that are crystal clear at, at, you know, at packaging time, that's still bottle condition. I mean, my brother has done it as well. He he still he never moved into the kegging setup, and he was he was worried about it. He made a brown ale that was crystal clear when he bottled it, and it took three weeks, but it it carbonated up just fine. There is more than enough yeast to do that. You have to be patient with it. Um, but the only way you know is if the is if I guess if the bottles never carbonate. And it sounds like El Muerte, El Muerte seventeen that that was the case that he was popping bottles and they just weren't carbonating. So that is a, yeah. that is interesting to me. Um, and, and who knows what what would have caused that? But uh, that is all the time that we've got for this episode is there anything else you have on yeast nutrients when making hard cider matt no the only thing i'd add is just check the nitrogen requirements of your yeast uh make sure that you're being consistent in your approach to how you're adding these take some notes but i'm i'm gonna say i'm pro like just as the final walk off of using these nutrients because they're (laughs) cheap it's easy insurance uh and who knows like in the right the right environment a different environment than this one it may make a more perceptible difference i think it probably would uh but we'll find out in the future yeah i'm with you uh i don't often give straight up advice but if you're making cider just pick up some cheap nutrients and use it it works well and don't forget to subscribe to our newest podcast the brew lab where host kate job takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss fascinating research they've completed and as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more.